In this episode, we talk about is the market crashing in general sentiments? And we discuss our experience of the hobby in this current market, what we like and don't like, and what we think it means for the hobby going forward. I just want to make this really clear. I think if you can buy modern booster boxes for under 100 US shipped, Yes, that's a good deal. The rise of Umbreon as the top card from Evolving Skies is a reflection of the fact that it is one of the few incredible cards featuring that Pokemon. Hello, beautiful people. This is Captain Zach Sparrow here. And I am Gray from the TCG Buyers Club. Welcome back to the Market Shuffle episode four. We're back, baby. <laughs> Feels good, yeah. <laughs> it does, right? It just, you know, there's something about the pod. It feels so official to me. Like I can record videos on my own, but it doesn't have the same vibe. I sit down here, we get the setup going, Zach, you and I start chatting, and I'm like, all right, this means business. This is serious. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, dude. Like I turned the light on and I was like, all right, it's go time. It's show time. So yeah. yeah. I feel like I need like some of that face paint or whatever. So I think it's, <laughs> that, I'll do that for the next one if I remember. <laughs> That'd be That's funny. funny, man. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to be back, and we've talked a little bit about what we want to discuss, and we both settled on just kind of a market update and our perspectives on what's happening in Pokemon. In episode one of the pod, we were coming in hot as the Japanese market was booming, and we thought it was wild that people didn't seem to be really talking about that as much. Um, and now, I think we both agree we're starting to see that Japanese market cool off, and there was just like a couple months there where it went pretty crazy and now it's quieting down. And then alongside a lot of the commentary we're seeing from other creators about Scarlet and Violet being a bad era, the cards not being worth very much, and the sealed products being pretty pretty low, especially when you consider the increased MSRP pricing. I think there's a lot of negativity in the space and in that market feeling. So uh, we're going to get into that today. What do you think, Zach? How do you want to <laughs> how do you want to kick this bad boy off? <laughs> I just like diving into stuff right away. So recently, I've seen quite a few videos of people talking about, oh, the sky is falling and oh my goodness, all these prices are going down and this and that. And it's cool. It's newsy. It's all that stuff. Of course, we said it a million times before. I always think that's a great time to buy. For sealed product, I just want to make this really clear. And this is why I'm kind of pausing and making this really impactful, we'll say. I think if you can buy modern booster boxes for under 100 US shipped to your door, right now that's a really 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 good deal like i <laughs> i haven't seen anything in the market i haven't seen anything more importantly from the pokemon company specifically to showcase or indicate any bit of hesitation on my side to, as to why i should be hesitant uh into buying into something like that uh again i don't mean to always bring it back to this but i i try to really exaggerate in my mind to uh, prove points to myself like for example if a booster box was 200 dollars right now and it's a newer set and i think mm -hmm. it'll be printed more i'm probably not going to buy it unless i want to buy like one or two just to rip or whatever the case mm -hmm. that's that's totally cool you you can do whatever you want as far as stunkability goes under that uh, nowadays the the dollars are always moving up over time but if it's under a hundred dollars nowadays that's a pretty good buy man like totally again if i can get a stock that historically is sold for plus a hundred dollars like a hundred ten dollars hundred forty dollars and i can buy in under a hundred dollars like we're literally at, at the point now to where we can buy numerous new sets sub literally at wholesale cost or even below literally just uh, stores are selling these at a loss right now mm -hmm. um do I think that's a good time to buy in when people are selling at a loss? Yes, unless the stock goes to zero, which is uh, always a possibility, I guess, for some people out there. Like, um, depending on you know how your brain works and how you want to look at stuff, that's fine. You know, risk mitigation and all of that. But if I can, I, I, I know I say this a lot of times, but if I can buy booster boxes under a hundred dollars, yes, that's a good deal. That, that's what I have to say right now. <laughs> I agree, man. I, I do think that the market is softening 
and I think that's okay. We we saw some kind of crazy stuff over the last couple of years when we were talking about the Japanese market. I think it was decidedly crazy, um, and things were just blowing up way way too much. But I also think that right now the the English Pokemon market is is in a really good place. Like one of the things I will say is. You know, I've been opening a little, like a lot more English cards than I have over the last couple of years. Now that I can get those sets pretty affordably and and readily, I can just walk into a store and buy an ETB without feeling like I'm paying an arm and a leg. And I'm having an absolute blast with them. Like the card art is amazing. I'm pulling fun stuff out of a lot of packs. Like I haven't had an opening and, and obviously it happens. Probabilities are what they are, but I haven't had an opening yet where I haven't pulled something cool that I'm kind of excited about. Um, and to me, where I've been trying to anchor myself is on the fundamentals of that experience. I'm walking into stores, finding cards on the shelves at reasonable prices, and I'm having a blast opening them. I'm like building out some binders and collections and sending them aside and like talking to my friends about it or like bringing my friends along and opening packs with them. And all of those things I think are just so positive for the hobby. And as much as they're not stonks um, and, you know, the value of what I'm getting out of these ETBs is generally not like matching the cost of the ETB. Um, I think I'm getting like the expected and a, a very positive expected experience out of it. And I think that that bodes really well for all of these products long term. Uh, and I've been talking a lot more lately in my content um, and with other collectors in the hobby about like why they're so negative on Scarlet and Violet when I think it's just so amazing and so much fun. Um, and to me, the only answer that I can really see people coming up with is that it's the value thing. Like they're not. They're, the cards aren't worth crazy amounts and um, you know, the products aren't like stonking and stuff like that. And I, I just don't think that that, if that was the outcome, I don't think that's in the best interest of the hobby. I don't think the boom, you know, vivid voltage and beyond for a couple of years, there was like a good thing for people getting in and staying in the hobby, even though admittedly that was the era I got in and, I, and I'm still here. <laughs> I think I would have had a better time and still been here either way, especially if I could actually find the products uh, at reasonable prices and open them and, and have that facet of the experience a lot more reasonably. Um, so I feel really good, but I don't know what that means like over the next year or two. And I do see the market softening. I'm just bullish on the long term because of how I am experiencing these products as just like, a fan and a collector. And to me, that's, that's the best marker for long-term success is, is the experience today good. And it is good again. I think that's amazing and, and being overlooked by some people. Yes. Um, I, I agree with what you're saying. I didn't mean to be smirking while you're talking there. You, when you kept saying like the market softening, which is true, I just kept thinking like, yeah, some of these graphs are looking a little flaccid lately. So <laughs> They but, are, yeah. <laughs> but one one thing I wanted to mention was I I again I agree with what you your your sentiment is. Do you have a certain way that you open cards pre recording? Because I I think you mentioned like now you you save most of your opening experience for recording and, and uploading, which is cool. Yeah. Um, that you share that with us. But before that, what was your pack opening experience? Like, no, nah, man, I'm so reserved. Like when I okay. make pack opening content, I, I don't do any, like I do tend to do voiceover commentary to the openings versus like real time reactions because my real time reactions are so boring and I, I have trouble like hamming it up even for content. <laughs> so when I'm doing voiceover, I'm like, all right, that's an awesome card. That's already, you know, five to 10 X ratcheting up the energy of my real experience. Um, I think I do probably have some some genuine reactions. Lately, the stuff I've been opening, I haven't been filming uh, for the most part. Uh, I've been doing less like pack opening style content, but I've been like opening packs with my girlfriend. And, you know, we pulled the full art Charizard from uh, Obsidian Flames pack recently. I was like, oh, like I definitely had a lot of excitement to it, um, even though I think it's it's an ugly, it's a really ugly card. I hate it. Well, you know, it's just the epitome of bad five band artwork is like the gold and full art cards from that set. Um, but yeah, that's like, I, I would say my pack, here's how I characterize my pack opening experience when I'm not recording is I still kind of like 
take my time. I try to be a little slow. I try to like look at every card and really sort of savor the experience a little bit and try not to just like rip the packs and like get through it in 12 seconds. Um, so I don't know. That's probably pretty lame. But ever since I was a kid, I've like, man, I used to like sleeve every card I pulled when I was a kid. You know, I just always tried to take it seriously and give the cards the respect I think they deserve. So. <laughs> I love that, man. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm just a big nerd. Let's be honest. That's that's funny. No, it explains a lot about you. No, um, I, uh, I, since you asked me, I feel like my my opening experience is a little different. Like my buddies call me before they open up a booster box or when I'm going to open one because they want to have. Uh, sort of that hype man experience. I guess it's just uh, my personality. It's just the way it just when, whenever I am opening something, I don't know what it's just the kid in me. Um, Cause I'm usually some, I don't know if I would describe myself as chill in my videos or not somewhat chill, but when I'm opening up cards, man, I'm like, yo, look at this, man. <laughs> like, and I could just be like a crabomitable that I'm always memeing and I'm like, yo, I pulled it, man. So that, yeah. that's usually how I pull those cards. Um, so I don't know what, it, when we do get to the point on the channel where I'm opening cards at some point, it will probably look like I'm faking it for the views or whatever. But even when I'm on my own, that's just kind of how I pull cards. And it's like, have you ever gone to a, like a sports game, right? Mm -hmm. And everyone's just really in it. They're all painted yeah. up or not wearing shirts and they're just all rah, rah. That's fun, right? Like, even if it's like, way past your normal zone it's sure. just fun to like get into that just be goofy you know at the club dancing with people or whatever what whatever it is that people get into like uh, even if you don't do that all the time th on occasion or whatever i think that's fun that's cool so totally yeah yeah for sure even if it's kind of like <laughs> hammed up and for the performance i think you can't fake it without feeling it a little bit yourself like it still makes the experience fun if you're kind of hamming it up and, and trying to push it a little more so Totally, totally agree. Um, good segue from that. Actually, I don't actually have one, but uh, the full art lily that I wanted to talk mm. about, um, yes. the number sixty six one, the Japanese side. That card um, during this boom period. So I know you mentioned quickly, Gray, but just for everyone, just kind of since I'm talking about this again here, on the Japanese side, yeah, we we were seeing that boom, and previously on the channel and even on this uh, podcast here, we were talking about, hey. Things are a little bit hotter than what we're comfortable in seeing. Could it go higher? Certainly. Could this aggressively pull back? Yes. Well, we've seen that now. Um, while I wasn't recording, that's funny timing, but it doesn't matter. Um, that particular Lily in a PSA 10, it, at the peak, it sold for just under $22,000. Again, this is a PSA 10. Sure, that was the peak as of now, at least. But you see more than a 50% pull, more than a 50% pullback on this card. Like what? The August 27th. So not too long ago at this point. So, I mean, that's the, that's the recent data we have on this particular card. Do I think there's more room to go down? Yeah, man. Like, yeah, yeah there's almost 600 PSA 10 copies of this card. Well, Zach, in the grand scheme of things, do you think there's going to be more than 600 people that like this card? Totally, yes. But do I think there's going to be other cool Lily Full Arts past this one as well? I also think that, so like, I just think there's a little bit more of that scenario that people aren't factoring, factoring into the market. And right now the market is agreeing with that sentiment that uh, at least I previously had, which was, hey, this is this makes no sense to me. Lily's cool and all, but seeing this much of an outlier on these kind of prices, again with the pop report looking at these cards, there are too many. Again, there are Japanese cards that are that are older than this particular card that are much more rare. And like you're talking about cards like Lugia, for example, and I'm like, there's no comparison in my opinion. Yes. Some kids today might not be as nostalgic for, for Lugia than some of us, you know, 20 year old, 30 year old, 40 year old men and women, mm -hmm. mostly men on this channel, but women too. Hey. Um, so I think 
there's a lot more room to go down from here even. Um, yeah. I would not be buying this card even at these prices. Like even if I had these kind of dollars to throw at one particular card for an investment purpose, I think that is an abysmal decision to make. Uh, what would unpack that however you like, Gray? <laughs> do you agree with yeah, any no. of that? <laughs> I mean, I do. I think it has a lot more room to fall as well. And I think, I mean, Lily cards across the board have this huge run up. I don't, I've been tracking them super closely, but I've just seen people posting about them on Instagram and elsewhere where stuff like, you know, the the like Cosmog Hollows from the Japanese 25th anniversary collection set, like the core set cards that, you know, you pull in every other pack because there's only like 25 cards in that set to begin with. And every one of them is hollow. Like those cards were getting this like huge run up. You're like, this is the most um, immediately available card. Like Japan printed so much of that set because it was so popular. There's so much of those and it had Lily in it. And so it was seeing this huge run up there. They're just always, you know, you learn watching these price movements and these, these waves of like, when there's this hype wave, it starts to become pretty obvious. There was this Lily hype wave. I, uh, I tend to think it, it could go down a lot. I think, are there more than 600 people who want that card? Like absolutely, but not at that price necessarily. <laughs> so we'll have to see where, where that actually settles, but it's nice to see some of these cards coming back down to earth a little bit. Um, and like, honestly, if this card, the Lily card continues to drop like another 50%, it's like, it's still an insanely valuable card for the length of time that it's existed. Uh, it's not that old. It's a beautiful, desirable card. Like that could be a reasonable resting spot. If that's like five grand instead of 20 in the end, you know, like you see Lily has become like the Charizard of the English market a little bit where, Japanese cards, the full art trainers have become really popular. And Lily is one of the iconic characters that people really, really like. Uh, kind of like how in English it's been Charizard for ages. And maybe that's, we've, we've maybe finally seeing that fatigue, the Charizard fatigue sit in. And like Umbreon is surging lately, um, which kind of puts a smile on my face. It's nice to see some other Pokemon get, uh, get some attention. But yeah, that's, that's my take on it, man. I think, uh, I also think it's kind of crazy. And we'll see where it goes. Totally. Uh, totally agree. So uh, I think that's a great uh, talking point, too. Actually, the Charizard fatigue, mm -hmm. um, just to throw my opinion in the hat here, I think I understand the sentiment as far as, dude, every set. We have some new, cool, crazy Charizard, mm -hmm. eventually new and exciting, but it's the same thing every time isn't as new and exciting as you might think it is. That being said, there's always new blood getting introduced to the hobby that haven't seen these Charizards from the past. So would they be excited about YouTubers talking about, look at this crazy new stained glass Charizard looking thing. This is really cool. Yeah. Um, I, so there's that too. Um, do I think that that would encompass the majority of the, the majority of the market? Um, no, but I guess what I wanted to talk about, like, for example, I'm looking at full art Charizard V right now from Brilliant Stars. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think the market is starting to figure out, hey, there are just way too many of these cards. Like, for example, there are over 6,000 copies of this particular card in a PSA 10. So, yes, I understand people's sentiment toward, I think they're just too many iterations of Charizard. My take is I don't need, I don't know if I agree with everyone's sentiment as far as too many Charizard iterations more so than I think the market simply cannot keep afloat all of these thousands and thousands, or in some Charizard cases, literally tens of thousands mm -hmm. of PSA 10 specifically uh, cards. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think I, I kind of agree with you. Um, so, I mean, I will say that that brilliant stars Charizard V artwork wise, we're talking about the alternate art. I think like that yeah. is easily one of my favorite Charizard artworks of all time. I think it's amazing. Yes. It's just so cool. And it's sort of a callback to, um, one of those other kind of older Charizard cards. I forget which one, but featuring like the battle between it and Venusaur is kind of classic. Uh, and then I love that the, um, premium collection 
box, uh, or sorry, the ultra premium collection box, the UPC for Charizard had that, um, was it? Yeah, it's um, Oswaldo Cato art that almost like depicted the aftermath of the alt art from that card, like Charizard resting, Venusaur's kind of resting in the background, like the trees and stuff around them are burnt down. Like there's a lot of cool storytelling and I don't know how much of it was planned versus how much the artist just did it or whatever, but there's a lot of really cool qualities to that card. It's just that the pops are out of control. And so you kind of end up having to ask yourself like, what is an appropriate price for this? And when like PSA tens look like they're selling for a couple hundred bucks here, like two, I'm seeing like two eighty to three hundred, give or take, yeah. on TCG fish, like that seems super reasonable to me for a ten of a card like that. Um, maybe it's still high, but because there's a bit of that Charizard premium, but it's like affordable, reasonable. It kind of reflects the desirability, but the fact of the matter is it's not truly rare or hard to get if you really want it. And maybe that's like totally, totally fine. I just think that Pokemon has been kind of milking the Charizard hype for a while now, and it's oh, yeah. it's just starting to catch up a little bit. It's been pretty bad through the Sword and Shield era, in my opinion. Um, and... I think if you're a Charizard fan, you just have so many options to collect incredible Charizard cards that when you're looking at like the new card and it's selling at some like hype peak price, you're like I don't need to pay that. Like I don't care that much because I already have these other incredible cards. Um, and so hopefully, in my opinion, hopefully the Pokemon company will back off the Charizard stuff a little bit. Um, like I think, I think the rise of Umbreon. And you know the Umbreon VMAX alternate art as the top card from Evolving Skies and kind of the Sword and Shield era period is a reflection of the fact that Umbreon's an awesome Pokemon, always had a pretty big fan base, but it is one of the few incredible cards featuring that Pokemon. So even if the hype or the overall popularity is less than Charizard, it's so it's able to concentrate itself in the few great examples, whereas Charizard is just so fragmented, even though there's so much popularity, like you have so many options, so many different cards. And I think that hurts it. And then you release a set like Obsidian Flames, which is very much a Charizard set. And people are like, this set sucks. It offers nothing because they're, they're less excited about the new Charizard cards than maybe we've seen in the past. So it's, it, I think it's just, it's a, just a reflection of the supply. And in this case by supply, I, I mean, specifically the different varieties of cards featuring this character that, are often very great, but there's just too many of them. It's like too much of a good thing. So um, I think I think that's all it is. And I hope that Pokemon slows down a little bit with it. And, and it gives an opportunity for other Pokemon to shine a little more. I think <clears throat> that's an excellent take. Um, maybe that can be part of our intro or something. But I, <laughs> I, I love the distinction of, hey, we, we don't see a ton of really great Umbreon artwork related cards. And... Hey, what is the card of even still the modern era? This one, yeah, it's definitely that Umbreon card, right? So, um, love that. And Sword and Shield, in my opinion, was a strong block, a very strong era. Yeah, and you have the chase card of that strong era, and it was that Umbreon. So that's that's really cool. Um, jumping back to that Alt Art um, Charizard V from Brilliant Stars. Um, this isn't a gotcha question question or anything. I I'm genuinely curious and to put you on the spot here for everyone mm. um, to which of course we could edit this, but you guys will never know. Um, sure. Of course that card at its peak at a PSA 10 at the very beginning was a thousand dollars. We, most people in the hobby know um, if you've been in it for a period of time, cards do stupid prices at the very beginning and then they pull back. But anyway, so we saw that. Um, but since the, the card has come out, over well over a year ago now, a year year and a half plus now, um, the card has just gone down and to the right. Do you think? Mm -hmm. And again, it's not a gotcha question. Do you think this card will continue to go down and to the right and kind of just kind of have that you know no life support ever again? Like maybe we'll see a random blip here and there. Like if there's a weird video made about the card in the future or something. But do you think this card will be kind of boring and flat for? literally forever um if you're someone new you just came into the hobby mm -hmm. you stumbled across this podcast and you're like man i really like this card i'm getting interested in this whole investing not investment advice of course but 
do is now a good time for me to buy? Should I wait another year or will this can or will this never really perform? And I should just buy it now so I have it now and I'd be happy and I know this is probably going to lose value or maybe stay stagnant for forever. What do you think? So I'm looking at it on pokadata.io so I can see the raw prices. And I'm looking at it over the last year for perspective. And like the raw prices have been surprisingly flat during that whole time while the PSA 10s have continued to dip in value. And so ultimately, I think the raw price is probably then about right. It's going at like 130, like, I guess it, it was closer to 200 a year ago. And now it's gone from like 180 down to like 135, one, like 120 to 130 in that range. Um, and I feel like that's probably about the right price for it. Like, I think that that it's unlikely that a, a card that's this hard to pull, even though there's a bajillion of them, it is truly hard to pull uh, from an aging set, even in high quantities. It's like, it's a desirable card. I feel like that's about right. So I think all that's happening is as more of them get pulled and specifically more of them get graded and more of them pop up as tens, the 10 price is just reflecting like the growing supply of, uh, of that card. But there, there should be a premium on the tens. It's like, if the card is a hundred, let's say the card should be like a hundred bucks minimum at this point in time, how many would you have to grade those raw cards you buy for a hundred bucks? to 130 bucks to get a 10 and how much are you therefore willing to pay to get a guaranteed 10 i feel like the price is probably in about the right place at like the mid high 200s for a psa 10 so i'm not sure it goes much much lower unless the demand for this card and maybe pokemon in general like drastically changes over the next couple months and i don't i don't think it would go much lower but we'll see that's, That's my uh, analysis. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate it. I always love, I, I, I truly do hearing other people's takes because it's, I would not have answered the question like that, but I mm. value that, right? So um, I hope that brings some of our listeners value. So how about that? Wholesome reply from Z here. But um, I am kind of thinking about what, what I think this particular card, what makes it interesting is it's not old enough for us to really know anything about it yet. But also to your previous point, one of your previous points, it's a really stinking cool artwork and it's yeah. unique in that aspect. And you have the like double Pokemon aspect of it. So that is interesting. Will this or can this do something like we've seen uh, something like the team up sets do uh, or like mm -hmm. co or Cosmic Eclipse sets? Yes, I, th I think it could. Will it? I don't know, because seriously, and this is what's really tricky. And I have this dissonance in my brain right now there's so many psa 10 copies it's so much it's so so much so like for example just to bring up like um i don't know uh, an opposite uh to play devil's advocate here a little bit for some people just to get this out there for some i'm looking at the 1999 uh neo lugia um the on the on the japanese side of course i see 568 PSA 10 copies right now, and you can get this card for $760. Mm. This card is well over 20 years old. I brought this up in some video before. I don't know. It's been so long ago now. It doesn't matter. It's worth bringing up again. Um, it's, it's an awesome card. It's iconic. Yes, it is Japanese, so it is different. Uh, I, it, it is it kind of an apples and oranges comparison in that aspect. But again, I wanted to bring up, because we were talking about Lugia earlier a little bit, um, I don't know, dude, because this card yeah. is so old and there's not many of them. It's, it's real bizarre. I don't like, again, fast forwarding into the future. I'm not talking like a year or two from now. I don't know what the Charizard card is going to do or any year for that matter, but 20 years from now, like kind of like where this Lugia is at, could it be like kind of sort of disappointing? Like let's assume mm. Pokemon continues, um, growing and it's a super iconic IP for 20 years into the future. Well, this particular, so ultimately, I don't think it's a good investment. However, mm. do I think it's a bad investment right now? Like, do I think like, oh, you, you could lose like 75% of your dollars or something? I don't necessarily think that. I think it will continue to go down into the right. I don't know for how long or for how far, um, but, it, but 
it really matters. Artwork really matters. Coolness factor really matters. I think enough people care about this, and the fact that it's anywhere close to this dollar amount right now uh, shows some of that. Yeah. But I also think some of the people from 2020 boom period of entering the hobby, statistically, a lot of those people will have yet to have left the hobby at this point. And I think we'll see some continued <laughs> softness, flaccidness from the market um, into the future. So all of that to say, I have no idea. Um, I don't think it's that great of an investment, though. Does that make sense? <laughs> Yeah, I think I agree. I was my analysis was definitely more rooted in like, is it an unreasonable price point to buy as of today? I don't I think it's pretty reasonable to buy at that price. If you really wanted a PSA 10 copy of that card, I don't think I would buy raw cards and try to grade them if I was going for a 10. Um, unless I was able to like really closely inspect the raw card before buying it and felt confident that it might grade a 10. Um, but to your points as well, like it definitely could continue to go down and we've, we've talked about it before. And, and I think both of us continue to be kind of baffled by the disparity between modern pop reports and price compared to some vintage pop reports and prices and like Japanese, like vintage Japanese singles um, tend to be surprisingly affordable when you're used to the English market. um, And you're looking at some of those older cards in particular, but there's so many little pockets of like incredible cards from 15, 20 years ago that just even in graded, no one, no one really cares. And it's so hard to understand and like line up. Like, well, how does that make sense? Like, what do we expect for cards that are already selling for hundreds of dollars in a PSA 10 over a 20 year period If 20 year old cards are only selling for like two times what they are today with like 5% of the population. Right. Absolutely. Totally agree. But, I do think I was glad you brought up like team up and cosmic eclipse. Cause I was looking at the booster box prices actually, as we were chatting, because if, if I think about what do I think is like a good indicator of the market strength at the moment, I think the performance of those booster boxes is a pretty good one to flag. You have the end of the sun and moon era, which was pre 2020 boom print volumes. So they kind of had this accelerated curve, I think based off of their availability, not nearly as much was made as the market kind of went crazy. But over the last couple months, we've been seeing some of these top tier late sun and moon booster boxes spike like crazy in value. And it's really hard not to look at it and go, that that makes sense. These were incredible sets with a phenomenal premise. The team up premise and and the the tag team GX cards, I think is some of the best like one of the best, if not the best concept for a card that Pokemon's ever done take two popular Pokemon, often like kind of different ones too. I think like Eevee and Snorlax are like such different Pokemon, but mashing them together in one card. So cool. It doesn't hurt that they hired Mitsuri, uh, Mitsuhiro Arita to illustrate all of the base versions. <laughs> like every single one in their more common variants is a total banger of a card with incredible unique artwork. Um, and then they did alternate art versions on top of that. Um, and seeing them continue to perform extraordinarily well as the rest of the market is softening, I think is a good perspective on how much demand is still there, how much people still value these types of things. And with a product that actually has kind of restricted supply relative to the current market, it's still performing like crazy. Um, so I, I like seeing that. I think it's a really good sign. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that any of these other new products are going to have any behavior like this anytime soon like we're in a completely different era with respect to print volumes uh and that just means that it's going to take time to eat up the product have people open it have it start disappearing where they can appreciate but i think personally and it's very much my own take when i look at the fundamentals of the scarlet and violet era of products i just think they are awesome sets they're really fun to open i think people are going to want to keep opening them for a long time and i think Five years from now, people are going to be excited to go back and open them, whether it's because they loved opening them now or because they're new to the hobby, but they've played the Scarlet and Violet games or not at all. And they're just like, those are cool cards. I'd love to open some of those. Yeah, so I I still feel good. I don't know. I don't know if I should be selling all of my stuff now because it's going to be a really long time or not, but uh, I still feel really good about where the cards are at. So that's that's my summary thinking kind of bring it all back now you know 
Yeah, totally. Um, and to that point a little bit, I'm not going to talk about this much because I wanted to talk about another older card, but um, just on the booster box side to that point, I, if money wasn't an issue, wouldn't you open up a booster box like every day or every week or whatever? Like For sure. if money's not an issue, wouldn't you just like rip a bunch of brilliant stars and shining totally. fates, ETBs and whatever, right? Like it's fun. Yeah. It's so much fun. Um, so I, that plays into things for sure. Um, however, going back to another previous point, as I was talking about the Lugia example, which I still think is fairly relevant, I do know some people might be thinking, which I think is a fair point, um, Zach, that Lugia card you brought up wasn't even English. Well, on the English side, like there's so few cards anyway, and you're talking about like tens of thousands of dollars in like one sale in like the last six months kind of deal. So um, it's hard to pull um, examples from there. And then as far as the Charizard side, I don't know of um, a specific Charizard that would showcase a really nice point. However, I happen to to pick out Dark Charizard from 2000. So from Team Rocket, um, the Unlimited Hollows. There are 159 of those in PSA 10 right now. And you're looking at just over $1,100 um, is... I know I say it, that's all. I know that's a lot of money to a lot of, I mean, that's just a lot of money for a piece of cardboard, let's be honest. But um, but it's only, I say that only, again, knowing the history of other Charizard cards like base set, this and that, um, it's only $1,100 after over, well over 20 years and it's dark Charizard. You're talking mm. about a cool uh, Pokemon and it's Charizard and it's Dark Charizard. So, I mean, it's really, really cool. And it's air quotes only $1,100. So as far as stonk ability into the future, like percentage returns wise, that's not very impressive. Actually, it's really not. Um, if you bought this card a while ago, um, it, it's not, it's, it's, it's not super impressive. However, um, it is, um, it's still good, but I, I'm, I'm just saying like, what do I think of like the modern day, like brilliant stars, Charizards and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So again, I just am trying to highlight a little bit. Hey, I wouldn't expect these cards to be like literally $10,000 in the future. I yeah. think that's insane. <laughs> like, I think that's almost definitely impossible is what I'm trying to showcase for people. Like there's definitely a ceiling here. No idea where it's at. Um, so yeah, again, I have no idea, but I just want people to know like, Historically, and I know it, it's not always fun to look at historical prices of certain cards that you don't personally care to. A lot of people haven't opened up Team Rocket um, and haven't had that experience, and they don't care. They couldn't care less about Dark, Dark Charizard. So mm -hmm. um, I just want people to be aware of that. So, yeah. Cool. So in summary, it, we started, I guess, talking about the state of the market and chiming in with a couple different perspectives. How would you conclude this episode of the market shuffle the state of the market is in what i think is a really exciting time i think now is a fantastic time to buy stuff if you're at all bullish mm. on pokemon sealed in particular and of course there are some cards that are good pickups as always there are always decent buying opportunities i still think we have a lot further to go down especially on the japanese side mm. so that's my take i agree I think it's a good time to be a collector. I'm I'm not super confident on the investing side of things. I think the products will do fine. I think you have to be careful at the price points you pick them up at because to me, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, I've not been like, aggressively buying really anything, quite honestly. Um, just because I, I don't know where it's going to go and I, I don't think it, I'm going to miss out if I sit on my hands for a couple months and kind of see what happens. But as a collector... And a player, I just signed up for my first regionals competition. So hey. um, they're coming to Toronto in October. So I said, you know what? I'm going. I'm going to compete. I can't wait. Um, I think it's an awesome time. Everything is accessible. It's affordable. It's fun. And there's all kinds of things from both like modern to vintage that you can get at the best prices we've seen in a long time, which is just great. So I'm, I'm trying to tap into that energy as well. Um, and I've just been having an awesome, awesome time. So I feel this like need to like inject some positivity into, into the world with some of the content and conversations that I've been having, because I'm having a blast. 
Uh, so that's that's how I feel. Unsure on the market direction, but feel really, really good about the hobby in general right now. Uh, and the outro is, you've been watching the market shuffle or the, oh, the truffle shuffle. You've been walking, watching the market shuffle. Do we continue with that? My girlfriend thinks it's so stupid, but I think it's hilarious. I think it's hilarious because it's so stupid. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And like every time we re we bring it back, it's like building a deeper commitment to that outro, which makes no sense because it's so stupid. Yes. But I think that's what makes it so funny. They're right. <laughs> so I am Captain Zach Sparrow, and I can do the truffle shuffle. And you've been watching the market shuffle. Thanks a lot, everyone. Toodles. <laughs> the stupid wave. <laughs>